sometime before 1846, sometime, someplace near Walden Pond, this man, Henry David Thoreau, wrote this. There are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the root. So this is a picture of a 12-year-old boy. It's a picture of an epidemic in America, childhood obesity. This epidemic has exploded in just the past 30 years. Since 1980, we have tripled the number of children who are obese. Children over the age of two now suffer one-third who are categorized as obese. And this epidemic, of course, has costs. The biggest cost is the explosion in type 2 diabetes, a kind of diabetes that used to occur just in elderly people. Now, half of the diagnosed cases come from kids. $147 billion annually spent because of this obesity. Now, why is it we've come to this place? Well, when I was a kid, I was fat. I told my parents it was genetic. It's a little hard, though, to imagine a whole generation being raised through a new genetic mechanism that has somehow turned them into fat. Of course, it's not genetic in this sense. It has everything to do with what we eat. And there's a consensus, of course, here, that we eat too much of this stuff and not enough of this stuff, or more precisely, not actually this, but high fructose corn syrup. 40% of the products in a supermarket today have high fructose corn syrup. Now, why is that? Well, one simple reason is the cost of sugar is high relative to the cost of corn. And the market enamored might say, well, that's the market. It's what the market's telling us, and the market is responding to input costs. But it's not quite like this. In fact, Sugar is expensive because the domestic sugar industry has succeeded in getting tariffs that protect them from foreign trade, benefiting them by $1 billion annually, costing the economy $3 billion annually because sugar costs two to three times the cost in other countries in the United States. And corn is so cheap because we subsidize it. $74 billion in the last 15 years, meaning that the cost of producing corn is actually negative, producing a radical shift in the costs of food. So between 1997 and 2003, the cost of vegetables went up by 17%. The cost of a Big Mac dropped by 5.4%. The cost of a bottle of Coke dropped by 35%. And it has radically changed how food gets made. You've all, I'm sure, seen this extraordinary film, Food, Inc., which talks about because corn is so cheap, we can afford to feed cattle corn profitably. Not profitably to the cattle, of course, because cattle can't process corn properly, meaning we have to feed them tons of antibiotics to deal with the diseases that get produced because we feed them corn, meaning we produce plenty of these very cool little superbugs that now produce salmonella in extraordinary rates in ways we can't deal with all because corn is so cheap and sugar is so dear. Why have we gotten here? Simple reason is campaign cash. As the Washington Post, not the New York Times, the Washington Post <laughs> said, 2004, some of the six producers of sugar succeeded through about a million dollars in election contributions to preserve the tariffs that protect them against competition. Of course, ADM has spent over the last 20 years millions of dollars to guarantee that the cost of corn drops dramatically. And so, Campaign money distorts markets, which distorts food production, which distorts our kids. Now, this is just one story. If I had endless time, which I'm told I don't, right? Um, I could go through an endless list of similar stories. Take Wall Street. Everybody now recognizes the bubble that burst last year was in part produced by deregulation of those markets, but what people don't recognize is the way that it was also produced by a certain kind of re-regulation, the way markets signaled or got the signals from the government that the government would guarantee those markets when the bubble burst through a bailout that these companies would get for the loss they suffered. And this combination of regulation and deregulation produced the dumbest socialism man has ever produced. Socialized risk 
privatized benefit. We get the risk, they got the benefits. An insanely stupid policy. So why is it we produce that policy? Well, directly at the moment that this policy began to be implemented, there was a skyrocketing in campaign contributions from these sectors, the fastest growing increase in campaign contributions coming from the security sector of any in the nation. Or take this tragedy of the Deepwater Horizon. Many of you, I'm sure, thought like I did, like how could it possibly have been that this could occur? I mean, weren't there environmental impact or risk studies going on here? I mean, after all, when we tried to get the uh, Cape Wind project through, it took nine years and 10,000 pages of environmental impact statements before this project would be approved. How about Deepwater Horizon? How many pages of analysis did the company have to make to get that approved? 17 before it was exempted from any further environmental impact analysis. Now, of course, Congress, when it was told about this, was shocked. Shocked. You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Everybody out at once. Yet, of course, it was Congress that had required that they approve these applications within 30 days of their submission because of an endless stream of campaign cash that directed Congress to change that policy. Or think about global warming. Two years after a supermajority in the Senate and a majority in the House and a president committed to doing something about global warming and $110 million spent by people like you supporting this reform, just last week, Congress admitted there's nothing that's going to be done about this problem. It has been abandoned for this cycle. Or think about health care, right? Many people looked at this and thought, wow, Barack had changed D.C. This man, Ezra Klein, a brilliant anal uh, uh, analyst who I always agree with, except in this one essay, wrote, the Obama administration succeeded at neutralizing every single industry. I look at this and I think, you know, I wish, right? Glenn Greenwald, I think, had this better. He said, if by neutralizing, Ezra means bribing and accommodating them to such an extreme degree that they ended up affirmatively supporting a bill that lavishes them with massive benefits, then he's absolutely right. The way this bill has been shaped is the ultimate expression and bolstering of how Washington has long worked. One can find reasonable excuses for why it had to be done that way, but one cannot reasonably deny that it was. Invoking the wisdom of perhaps the last century's greatest philosopher, David Byrne, same, same as it ever was. It ever was. It ever now, in all of these cases, we have good souls hacking at the branches of evil, none striking at the root. But in our history, there have been exceptions to this law of Thoreau. Jefferson was an exception. As he wrote, we should look forward to a time when corruption in this as in the country from which we derive our origin will have seized the heads of government and be spread by them through the body of the people when they will purchase the voices of the people and make them pay the price. And about a hundred years after Lincoln spoke, of course, everybody knows Eisenhower's fear about the military-industrial complex. What most people don't know is the first draft of Eisenhower's speech actually spoke of the military-industrial-congressional complex until his congressional aides told him he had to take that bit out. Now, these are good souls who got it. And we need those good souls to inspire us to find a way to strike at this root, this root, not this pretty root here, but what is the root of the problem that this democracy now faces? Well, I don't know a better explanation than in this book by Robert Kaiser, So Damn Much Money, describing the rise of a new form of lobbying, what he describes as a kind of economy, an economy that has lobbyists benefiting members, members benefiting interests, interests benefiting the lobbyists. It's a system of dependence, where members are dependent on lobbyists who are dependent on special interests, which of course translates into interests controlling members in this marionette congress which produces the kind of legislation we all see. There's a currency to this dependence. 
It's not the standard dependence of drugs or alcohol. It's a dependence on money. And not money in brown paper bags. I'm not talking about Rob Lagojevich corruption. I'm talking about money to support campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has gone through the roof, members who spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to get back to Congress or get their party back in power become dependent not upon the people, but upon the funders. This economy, this dependency, this distraction has an effect. Its effect is policy that gets changed. Sometimes profitably, this study from the University of Kansas estimated the return on investment from the lobbying dollars spent to amend the American Jobs Creation Act. They found the return on investment was 22,000 percent. Good money if you can get it, and you can get it, it turns out, in D.C. Or this study just released last year at UCLA describes how for every dollar spent trying to lobby to lower taxes for big corporations, they achieved a six to twenty dollar reduction in the taxes those corporations paid. Sometimes brazenly, so this story, oops, New York Times, sorry. This story from the New York Times at the beginning of February describes how Chuck Schumer went back to Wall Street to raise money for him and the Democratic Party, but was met with a chilly reception, as the paper put it. Cities titans of finance at a recent closed-door meeting accused him of being insufficiently pro-Wall Street. One indignant fellow stood up and demanded his donation back. Now remember, this is Chuck Schumer. There is no person in the United States Congress more responsible for deregulating Wall Street than Schumer, but he is not sufficiently pro-Wall Street for Wall Street. Or sometimes just grotesquely. Here are the top 10 hedge fund managers from last year. How much money do you think these people made, each of them, on average, last year? Just give me a number. 30 million? 1 billion? 2.5 billion dollars on average. Okay, how much tax did they pay on that $2.5 billion? I assume not many of you made $2.5 billion, but just extrapolate from the tax you paid on what you made. <laughs> You'd be wrong. They paid 15% on their $2.5 billion because the way that income is allowed to be categorized. Obama came to office promising to change that, took the idea to Congress. Congress said, are you kidding? We can't make these guys our enemies. So this policy continues to this day. This economy of influence is the root for the insanity that guides this institution right now, and we have rewarded this institution with the respect they deserve. 11% of Americans have confidence in Congress today. There were more people who believed in the British crown at the time of the revolution than who believe in our Congress today. Now, the only way we can strike at the root of this is an idea that Teddy Roosevelt had 100 years ago, citizen-funded elections. Elections funded exclusively through small-dollar contributions from citizens, not corporations only. Now, if we had a Congress so elected, that would make it so that when Congress did something stupid, which, of course, they're going to do something stupid regardless of what they do, we can believe, like we all want to believe, that it may have been because there were too many Democrats or too many Republicans or not enough attention spent, but whatever the reason was, it was not because of the money. An essential premise of trust that we believe they are making their mistakes on the merits and not because of this influence. Now, there is in Congress right now a bill that would do this. It has about 160 co-sponsors, the Fair Elections Now Act, that would make it that the maximum contribution was $100 per citizen for a candidate. So, are the Democrats or even the Republicans thinking about pushing this idea? No. Their great idea is the Disclose Act. These are the Democrats' idea. The Republicans have effectively stopped it. The Disclose Act makes it so it's easier for us to see the influence that corporations are buying through the money that they spend in Washington. Now, what is the Disclose Act? This is the Disclose Act. It is that webcam that sits underneath the water and watches the muck flow into the Gulf. It is the equivalent of us being able to see this muck. Okay, I think it's important to see the muck. I think it's good to know what the muck is there, but 
I don't actually need to see it much longer. I think what we need to do is to stop the muck, to stop the process where this pours into our political system and pollutes it in a way that makes it so it can't function. And because, not just of the bad results that we've seen, but a point that Lincoln, again, would have recognized directly. In his most famous speech, Gettysburg Address, a speech dedicated to this great civil war, a war that was to decide whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated could long endure. Lincoln was not there to celebrate the success of the campaign, but to point to the great task remaining before them. That task was to guarantee that government of the people by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Of, by, and for. Now, it would be an exaggeration to say that government has perished from the earth now. But on our watch, it has certainly withered. And if more of you don't do something to change this now, it will die. If more of you don't become involved in the process of stopping this practice of hacking at the branches and start striking at the root, this democracy of, by, and for will die. Join that fight. Thank you very much.